Do you want to talk into my mic? <laughs> I'll just come I, like really close. Yeah, go. Hi. Hi, okay, so this is Henrik. Um, That's me. <laughs> <laughs> Hello? Ah, there we go. Um, he has had a pretty prestigious career contributing to open source projects, among other things. I did not say that. <laughs> <laughs> he told me to say that. Um, he's paying me. Um, and he's here to talk to us about Prometheus and metrics. Should be interesting. Okay, hi everyone. <coughs> I'm Said Hinek. Um, <laughs> she said everything you know to know about me, but I swear I did not say that. So, uh, it's great to speak for the first time in Africa. Uh, when I saw the CFP, I knew immediately that I have to seize this opportunity for strictly professional exchange. <laughs> <laughs> I d how did this get there? Uh, so, Big Bay was great this morning, <laughs> but um, enough silliness. I'm actually here because I want you to be able to predict performance problems. Because preventing fires is easier than stomping out uh, a wildfire. Wait, I got this wrong. Stomping out blazes is better than fighting wildfires. I need a moment to get going. <laughs> so, <coughs> if something happens anyway, I want you to be alerted by your system and not by your uh, hysterical boss who comes storming into your office. And if the fire is burning, because there's always a fire burning eventually, I don't want you to stare at the top output um, with your boss poking their finger into your back. I want you to have all the data you need about all the systems you have right at hand in a meaningful format. And of course, all of this should feed back. So once something happens, you want to put an alert on it. And ideally, you want to figure out a way how to anticipate this problem in the future. So, um, and if you want to reason about these kinds of things, you need an objective representation of them. And this is where metrics enter the <coughs> stage. And metrics are just numbers or samples. The special thing about them is that they are um, timestamped in a database, which makes them a time series. And additionally, you will have a lot of them because you want to be able to correlate them, which gives you a new ways to uh, derive meaning out of those numbers. And you get those numbers by adding instruments to your systems. It's just like in a car or in a plane, except that your instruments are hooked up to a so-called time series database. Actually, uh, the pl plane instruments are also uh, connected to various databases called the black box. But uh, in this case, you have your own database. It will store it, and it will allow you to uh, query it or um, make nice graphs out of it. Now. You, of course, want to uh, instrument your application, in this case, probably Python, hopefully, but also your dependencies, like your database, your web server, your load balancer, they all carry very useful information for you to uh, pick and to correlate with your application metrics. Additionally, you want to uh, instrument your environment, which means things like your server load, your memory, your I.O. activity, all these things are important. And finally, you can also instrument your business, like the number of customers, the number of paying customers, which can be a very different number, especially if you are in a, a San Francisco or something. And of course, the daily revenue. And seeing a graph that correlates your uh, front-end latency with your uh, sign-up rates can be very enlightening because people actually care about these kind of things. Now, nothing of this is really new. People have been doing this for years, I've been doing this for years, um, but in the past you had to choose multiple components that did not really integrate well. You had to get an overview over the whole situation, what's available, how what works with wha what, and it was really intimidating. So m many people chose to not do it. Uh, so Prometheus is different. Uh, Prometheus gives you a well-rounded and opinionated uh, starting point because um, it's flexible, but it's really proven and well-documented. You spend your time mostly on one uh, documentation page. And while opinions are a dime a dozen in Prometheus' case, it's a little bit more because it's mostly written by ex-Googlers, or at least the project has been started by ex-Googlers who were missing their favorite monitoring system called Borg at their new startups they were working, mostly in this case, a SoundCloud. And that's how Prometheus happened. And I'll give you a short architecture walk so you kind of understand how everything fits uh, together. So Prometheus is a single binary, which you just drop on your server. 
which means that you already know that it's written in Go. <laughs> it doesn't have any dependencies, and it has a very low operational complexity, which is really nice. So you don't need anything special. You don't need a big server. You don't need a cluster like with OpenTSDB. You just need a server, and you can get started immediately. And its central feature is the effective storage of time series. So what exactly is stored? Internally, every th as a time series is just a named stream of float samples along with timestamps. But of course, that's not very practical. So uh, Prometheus wants you to think in uh, four types that are built on top of these streams. So first, there's the counter, which counts things. It can only increase but it can increase by any value. So you can use it to measure your traffic, uh, internet traffic uh, throughput or something like that. Then there are gauges, which are super useful to expose numbers from your applications uh, to the outside. So, and they can be set to any value. So it can be like the server load, the temperature in a, in a DC, or the number of active requests, number of connections in a, data <coughs> in a connection pool, all these things. Now these two, are pretty, pretty easy to guess how they map on uh, named streams. The other two are a bit more complicated. So first there's a summary, and a summary takes values, it observes values, and it allows you to compute the rate they come in, so like requests per second, and the average measurement. So in this case it would be the average request time. Some clients um, and Python is explicitly not one of them, also allow you to define percentiles that are computed within your application, which I personally f don't find very useful anyway, because you cannot mathematically, meaningfully uh, aggregate percentiles. It just doesn't make any sense what, what you get. And uh, it adds server load. If my application is screeching, I don't want it to be even busier by deriving numbers. So. This brings us to my f favorite, which is the histogram, which is also about observing numbers. So they have the same API, basically. Uh, but additionally, you define buckets. And those buckets should uh, represent your typical sizes that you will be observe. And Prometheus then is able to estimate percentiles on a server side from those buckets. And I've said percentiles twice now because they're very important. And when I get a longer slot, I usually, at this point, explain percentiles a bit uh, further. So who knows what, what percentiles are? OK, about a half. So uh, I make it really short. So imagine you have 100 latencies you've measured, 100. Now you sort them by value. Um, and then you look at the nth value for the nth percentile. Um, in real life, of course, you have more or less 100 values, then you have to partition them, and you have probably extrapolate. Uh, but what does this mean in practice? In practice, it means that if you have the 50th percentile, and the 50th percentile is one millisecond, it means that 50% uh, of your requests are done by one millisecond, which is also the median. So percentiles are very useful because you can ask questions like, how slow are the slowest 1% of my requests? Which is an important question, because it's still one out of 100 of requests. But uh, those values get smoothed out if you just look at uh, averages or medians. Of course, the, uh, by definition, percentiles throw out most of their values. So it's not enough to have them. You also need the average, because you need some way to distill all numbers into one number that rep kind of represents your quality of service. Anyway, so much for percentiles. They are great. Uh, they are hard to explain, but uh, easy to understand. So let's talk about metric naming next. Uh, anyone who ever used Graphite or StatSD will know uh, such metric names. You have to encode all the metadata into the name of the metric, which is kind of terrible to use and handle. So Prometheus and all modern uh, time series databases use bare names. And in this case, the best, uh, best practice is to prepend them with uh, the application name. This is not a good application name. This is a short application name, so I can uh, use the biggest possible font size. And you append the you append the um, unit. So a total is a counter, 
if you are measured times, then it would be seconds or something like that. So you immediately know what you're looking at. Now, you add metadata using labels, like this. And uh, each new label combination still adds you a new time series. So, or how they call it, a dimension. So you're not getting less time series, but uh, they're much better to handle. They are better to, uh, you can more easily aggregate them. You can make easy queries on top of label values, which is much harder if you just uh, put everything into a single name. Now, where do those values come from? And that's a, one of the biggest differences between Prometheus and most other systems, because it's pull-based. So each instrumented system exports its uh, metrics via HTTP, and Prometheus scrapes them. So if I want to use the uh, metaphor from before, you just add instruments to your systems, and uh, Prometheus comes around regularly, and you can set how often, writes down the value, and adds a timestamp to it. That's all. Now, uh, this means that you can adjust the resolution of each target by configuring how often you write them down. So if you need a high resolution, you, you have to uh, look more often, which means that you will use more disk space, and vice versa. But it also means that if scrapes fail for some reason, because, for example, the system is under too much load to uh, serve its metrics reliably, you don't lose data or meaning, you just lose resolution. So your average rates still make completely sense, which is the opposite of uh, lost samples that make the rate sink, although uh, your the load on your system is rising beyond its capacity to report its status. And this is double bad if you are using UDP. Don't use UDP for metrics if, you, if they're important to you. Now, this makes Prometheus great for monitoring uh, systems, but it makes it kind of useless uh, if you want to do things like accounting, where you need each individual value you're measuring. If you want to do that, you have to go for Postgres or InfluxDB. That are specifically databases that uh, work on top of single values. Now, pull us a few problems, and I'm going to go into them. So first, short-lived jobs, like backup scripts, or any script whatsoever. You don't want to uh, your script to become a daemon just so you can uh, have the metrics pulled out. For that, we have a so-called push gateway. Um, it takes metrics from short-lived jobs, and it keeps them for Prometheus to scrape. Problem solved. Then, of course, if you want to scrape your targets, you have to know that they actually exist. Um, this is a less of a problem than you might think, may think of, because if you want to do meaningful monitoring, you still need to know what systems you want to monitor. So you can put information into your metric system already. And you can either do it using configuration, <coughs> like in this case. A target is a system that's instrumented, and a, list, a group of targets <coughs> It's a so-called job. Now, um, you get both automatically as labels uh, from the metrics that are uh, scraped, which means that those metrics all share the same name and you differentiate them on top of the instance and the job label. Now, that's one way. This, by the way, uh, configures Prometheus to scrape itself, so you get useful information about how many time series do you have, how full out the buffers, information you need to uh, run a system, basically. <coughs> now, in practice, you will use some kind of uh, service discovery. We personally use, use uh, console, and like a month ago or so was the pr uh, Prometheus conference in Berlin, and there was a poll on uh, who's using console, like uh, most hands went up, and who started using console because of Prometheus, and uh, most of the hands stayed up, which was kind of funny. But console is great, so it's, it's also pretty easy to operate. But if you don't like it, uh, Kubernetes has uh, Prometheus support built right in. You can use DNS, you can use files, whatever. Uh, there are many ways to get your data in. Now the final problem, and the only actual problem, is uh, our systems you cannot really access, like Heroku or other load balances or netted uh, systems. Or, for example, end-user appliances. Imagine something that runs in a network of an end-user. You cannot scrape anything from them. And uh, Prometheus is, very sim uh, generally speaking, intended to run in the same network like its targets. So 
If that's not possible, it may be uh, the wrong choice. Now, of course, pool has a lot of advantages too. So first one, uh, you can have as many Prometheus servers as you want and just point them at the same targets. So you get high availability very simply. And you get production data in your test environment. So we, for example, had an intern who was working on our Prometheus stuff, and we didn't have give him the keys to all our systems. But we gave him access to the uh, metric endpoints, and he just ran Prometheus on his notebook, and he could get everything done what he needed to do. So that's pretty cool. Then it's really easy to uh, reason about outages if if uh, a scrape fails. Because failed scrapes mean, okay, something is going on. The, the system is either down or overloaded. It's very different with a push-based approach where you have to keep track about uh, when did I last hear from a system. One of my favorite uh, features is that it's very predictable because the, the load created by your monitoring system is always the same. You, s you tell it, uh, look every five seconds uh, and save it. It doesn't get more when you get more load. So you are not dosing your own network. It's already overloaded, and now there's like this bunch of UDP traffic additional to it for each single request. <coughs> and finally, it's fairly easy to instrument third-party uh, systems because most production-ready systems expose some kind of metrics. So uh, any database you can think of has some special tables with, perf with performance metrics. Java has JMX. Web servers have their status pages. Uh, you can parse your logs using mtail, which allows you to formulate uh, metrics on top of regular expressions. And it's a very powerful way to get data out of your systems without even touching your applications. And then you, you just have to transform those metrics you, you expose, uh, uh, you extract into something that Prometheus understands. And it's actually something you can understand too. Because in any case, hello? Uh, the each system exposes its metrics in a human readable way. So in this case, uh, you just have to point a browser at it basically because it's HTTP. So in this case, we have a histogram which uh, measures latencies. Again, short name for big font. Uh, don't do this at home. And um, this is what you get out of a summary basically. You get a counter, so we counted 390 uh, requests, and the sum of the measurements, which in this case is 177 point something seconds. Now, these two values are super cheap to keep track of because you're just adding float numbers. That's fast, even in Python. You don't have to um, rewrite it in Go. That's, this works just fine. Now, and this is literally what uh, Prometheus is going to serve, uh, a save or store. This is, uh, these are the time series. It will store it along with a timestamp. Mm. Now, by regularly scrapping this with the timestamps, you can compute the rate they are rising. So this is already enough to compute the average request time. And this is, all, as said before, this is what you get when you use a summary. But again, I don't find summaries useful. I don't use them at all. I use histograms. So in histograms, you need your buckets, which again are just multiple time series with a special label, LE. And this label uh, is the upper limit for the value that fits into this bucket. And of course, it trickles down. So um, as you can see, something that fits into 0 0.5 also fits into 2.0. So um, again, uh, percentiles are only interpolations, but they are good enough in practice if and only if you uh, choose good bucket sizes. And you, so you should make sure that your values distribute kind of um, evenly over your buckets because you cannot really uh, extract any anything meaningful if everything is just in the inf bucket or something. So please define your buckets based on latencies you have not the latencies you would like to have. Because, um, and it's really easy to see in the graphs if you uh, screw this up, because then you just get uh, all percentiles equal, and then, yeah, then it's, then it's time to face reality. Now, 
We have metrics in our database. What do we do with them? We query them. And Prometheus comes with a query language called PromQL, which doesn't even try to be like SQL. And there was a great talk at PromCon explaining why. And I don't have the time for a proper introduction, but you should know it's actually Turing complete. So people have implemented uh, the game of life in PromQL. <laughs> so uh, it's really, really powerful. But I will show you a few examples to get a, so you get a feeling. So first, if you have many related time series, like a job with five uh, instances, you want to be able to aggregate them uh, to one or a few. And that's where aggregation comes in. So for example, say you have many backends in multiple data centers. East Coast, West Coast, or uh, yeah, I, d I don't know what would make sense to say in uh, South Africa, but <laughs> um, so and let's say you want a total request rate over all backends in over all data centers, and let's work ourselves from the inside out. So we take the counter from before, and to compute the rate, we need a so-called range vector. So th this will return the values for this metric for the past one minute. So it's like an array or vector. And then rate will look at the first and the last one and uh, compute the rate out of it. Now, um, yeah. now at this point, you know how fast is this uh, value rising. And because we want only one value, we sum it up. And at this point, you're done. You have one value over all your backends. So what if you want to know the rate of backends of one data center? Then you add a label. In this example, like DC equals West. And you get only one. The, r the rest is all the same. And here you can see how easy and conven convenient it is that the metadata is in labels in a structured way. Now, um, finally, you may want to know the rate of all data centers, but broken down by data center. And that's, you drop, you drop the filter again, and you tell some to sum up by DC, by a specific label. Done. So uh, what else is interesting? Percentiles are interesting. Now Prometheus uses so-called so fee quantiles, which oversimplified are percentiles divided by 100. So this is the 90th percentile or P90, some people call it like that. And we take the rate of the bucket and we will compute the quantile. Again, in this case, you have as many quantiles uh, as you have um, time series that will match this uh, expression. So you will probably want to aggregate them. But uh, you've got two percentiles and Percentiles are super super useful, and uh, at this phase, for example, you see like the 90th, the 90th, 1990th, and the 99.9th. Oh, sorry, <laughs> uh, and you see how big of a difference it makes. Uh, so the lowest one is the 90th, and it's it looks like a straight line, and the other one get more volatile. Um, with uh, yeah, you just get more volatile, so because um, it's less less users that are affected. So we, we've seen how powerful PromQL is. So where else are we going to use this? So of course, in visualizations. So this is the internal one. It's great for quick ad hoc queries that you then maybe use elsewhere. You can drill into your system uh, you and, and so on. But they do not allow uh, more than one expression. So you cannot correlate values within this, this thing. Uh, but you can build like uh, dashboards using Go templates, which doesn't sound that much fun to me. So let's look at other uh, alternatives. So first, there's PromDash. And it has the best integration still. And this used to be the f uh, former official one. But it has been deprecated because Grafana added first class Prometheus support in its core. And Grafana is the best and best looking uh, monitoring system you'll ever see. And it's so much fun to play with it. So many people just start uh, collecting metrics so they can play with Grafana. And once you have some, some degree of values, you will probably just spend a few hours to uh, play with it. And it's OK. Maybe something useful will come out of it. Um, so 
it has many, many integrations, which means that if you have existing instrumentation, you can build dashboards that uh, are based on Prometheus, InfluxDB, and Graphite, all in one dashboard. And that, in this case, allows for step-by-step -step, uh, migrations or introductions. So just, just use this. It's great. Now, the final piece of the puzzle is alerting. So you can use PromQL to formulate alert conditions. And Prometheus will push them into a separate daemon called the Alert Manager. And again, a really quick example. So, let's talk about monitoring for full disks. Once they're full, it's too late, way too late. Alerting at some threshold, like 90% or something, can lead to noise because uh, if it's rising by one byte per day or something, 90% is still uh, a lot of time to replace them. So that, that gives you a lot of alarm fatigue. You want to be your alerts meaningful. If you're getting alert messages that are not immediately actionable, you, g you are getting too many alert managers. So in this case, let's use a crystal ball to determine uh, in time that your disks are filling up. And we will define an alert that will fire fi four hours before uh, the disk is full. And for that, again, a crystal ball, which is called high school mathematics, uh, and it's linear regression. So in this case, it's we take a metric and look on, on we look on the values of the past one hour. And if based on these values of the past one hour, the capacity of your file system is less than zero, within four hours, and this, uh, s this expression is true for five minutes, so you don't get like flukes, then you want to be alerted. And how do you want to be alerted? Alert Manager is really uh, uh, versatile when it comes to its backend, so you can use pager duty, you can use emails, you can use webhooks, which which gives you Slack, which is what probably most people uh, want. So, final question, how do you make this web scale? And the question, uh, the answer is federation. So Prometheus can uh, get uh, its values from other Prometheus servers. So the typical use cases are to aggregate. So for example, each team has one Prometheus server and there's one big that pulls in the data from the other ones, or downsampling. So maybe you have one really fast server with a lot of uh, resolution um, but which is great for alerting and great for beautiful graphs, but you don't want to store it for like a year or something. So you have a second uh, second server which has a lot more storage, and it but, but it uh, samples the also the uh, time series down. Additionally, third parties are right now building horiz horizontal alternatives, so DigitalOcean, which is one of the biggest Prometheus servers, has what called Vulkan, and I think it's based on HBase or Cassandra. And Weaveworks has Frankenstein and Prism, and that is built on um, EC2 AWS primitives. OK, you should have a general idea on how Prometheus works now. And let's focus on how to get that in next. And we'll start with the environment, because it's the least intrusive thing. So Prometheus went public. Well, now it's maybe like uh, one and a half years ago. And it had a really active uh, ecosystem. So these are all uh, available, or a very small subset of the uh, available exporters. And the important part is that they are also uh, so-called bridges, uh, which means you can just point your existing instrumentation f from StatsD, from Graphite, from InfluxDB at these, and they will forward it to Prometheus. So you don't have to touch your applications or your systems. You just change the configuration and, and uh, send the data elsewhere. Now, native is better, so let's look uh, further. For f fully featured servers like uh, Metal, KVM, LXC, anything that you c allows you to run a daemon within the machine, you use Node Exporter, which is an official solution from the Prometheus team. And you know what comes next? Of course, it's a ship with the containers on it. So for Docker, there's C Advisor, and C Advisor will instrument your systems from the outside using existing APIs. And C Advisor also works with LXC and others, so it's a rather versatile uh, um, approach. Now, these uh, exporters will give you a full system inside. 
um, you get stats about CPU, memory, network I.O., and much, much more. And this is incredibly useful if you are uh, trying to track down problems. So make this an automatic part of provisioning servers, not an afterthought. Or thought. Um, so what else should you instrument that is not your app? Always instrument the edges of your infrastructure. So usually some kind of web servers or load balancers. Um, they all carry uh, metrics information, use it. There are several black box exporters, which will probe your system from the outside using HTTP, ICMP, or uh, TCP. So they are poor developers' uh, pingdoms, basically. The problem with those is that they uh, create additional load, which may be a problem, but doesn't have to. But yeah, this is, again, looking from the outside. Then, of course, databases. I've said it before. Every database has metrics you can scrape. Scrape them. And if you run your own infrastructure, um, the SNMP uh, exporter will give you all the information about your switches that you need. Now, at this point, we have detailed information about our platform. We can probe your, our application using um, a black box exporter, or we look at the logs using mtail. And we, yeah, we know that we can instrument third parties. And probably there's al already an exporter for you ready to be used. Now, assuming you instrument your web server, you can at this point already correlate request times with various platform metrics and dependency metrics, which is already very cool. But we need to drill deeper. And for that, we will touch your code for the first time. Now, to make things interesting, we'll use an e a concrete example. And of course, it includes cats. So let's assume you've built a groundbreaking product, uh, which is a software that can save you a lot of time because it tells you if a picture contains a cat. So you don't have to look at other pictures. Now, to deploy it, you want to have at an HTTP endpoint for it, where users can post a picture, automatically, of course. We won't save time here. And um, <laughs> it will just uh, answer with meow or nope, depending on whether the picture contains a cat. So how hard can that be? We will write a little Flask web service. Now, you don't need to even know Flask, or even Python for that matter, to understand this little snippet. We check the authentication. And because your colleagues le read Hacker News, it's a microservice written in Go, deployed in Docker using Kubernetes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so additionally, we have an expensive computation, which actually looks at the picture and tells you whether it's a cat. And I bet lots of you have written APIs like this if you're interested in, in metrics. It's, yeah, it's a nice way to expose some functionality of something. Now, let's instrument it. And for this, we use the official client. And before we change any code, we will use a really cool feature of it and just start the HTTP server, which runs in a background, in a background thread. And on Linux, you get process metrics for free immediately. Uh, you do not get that on OS X or Mac OS. So don't be confused if you are trying this out on your notebook and you don't see any metrics, because it's just a platform thing. So you get this only on Linux. And without doing anything else, you get your memory usage. You get the time when it's a Unix timestamp from when the, the process has been started. You get your CPU seconds. You get the number of open files and the, number of, uh, the maximum number of open files, which is super useful and has a fun story behind it because SoundCloud had a major outage, outage because they were leaking FTs. Hilariously, it was uh, part of Prometheus integration something something um, but yeah now everyone has these useful metrics so without any further action without touching your actual code you can already detect memory and file handle leaks which happen to the best of us um, and of course you can monitor whether you approach the FD system limit for whatever reason now let's start instrumenting for reals. And for that, we defined some uh, metrics. Uh, the first one is a histogram about the request latency. Second one is a, the picture analysis time, because we want to know how long does the actual analysis take. And a gauge of uh, the number of running requests right now. 
and we will add them to your application. And these decorators do exactly what they sound like. The first one counts the number of uh, yeah, function calls that are in progress, which in this case means the number of uh, requests that are in progress. And the second one measures the time. Now, you might be saying that middleware would be better for this because then you can add labels using the view name, the status code, and whatever. And you'd be completely right, but Werkzeug middleware is out of scope here, so let's keep it simple. This is good enough in this point. So, additionally, we, as I said before, measure the time it takes uh, to actually analyze the picture because for all you know, all the times is sinking into the authentication, which in turn ostensibly is not instrumented at all. And it's because I decided to make it a shared package. So let's instrument the package. And this is the thing, because if you use something ten in 10 apps, you shouldn't instrument it 10 times. So we, again, define a metric that measures the time it takes uh, to, to do what it does. And then, additionally, we count errors. Because I said it's a microservice, which means it's a distributed system. That means it will fail at 4 a.m. Uh, for dubious reasons. So we just count them and try again. And yeah, this is not um, the right way to retry into a distributed system. Please, I'm waving my hands. It's uh, just a short way. So if this rate goes up, you have a problem, a big problem. Additionally, we also count the wrong login attempt, because this can be an important red flag too. It can mean you're under attack, or it can mean that your uh, authentication server has some subtle error going on that uh, reports wrong credentials uh, instead of uh, server errors, because the socket died or whatever. Now, these, uh, these metrics have the same name in all applications, and you will differentiate them using the labels. Cool. So, if done properly, so uh, which means you instrument your shared libraries and you put your web-related metrics into the middleware or even uh, into the whiskey container, you're left with one extra line, which is tolerable. And, and but you also shouldn't be ashamed of instrumentation because any production quality software has some uh, instrument sh instrumentation to s to a certain degree. Period. And it will pay off eventually. Uh, nobody will ever re regretted to have too much data um, when th things were going down south. So I don't know how popular it is in South Africa, but what about async? So in Russia, you get applause at this point because they love async IO. And I personally love async IO too. I c still kind of love Twisted. And that's the reason why I wrote uh, Prometheus async, which does the right thing for deferred and for coroutines. And for that, it will just wrap the existing uh, metrics from the official client package. Because I don't want to do math. You don't want me to do math. So I just do what I can, and that's writing coroutine code. So, But it comes also with some goodies. So first, uh, AI, it offers an AIO HTTP uh, metric exporter, which is much more configurable and versatile than the one that comes uh, with the official client. That is basically just bu uh, built using the uh, simple HTTP server from the standard library. It can run in a thread, so you can use it with any Python 3 application, which I do. I deploy all my pyramid apps with Python 3.5 and uh, this exporter. And it also includes automatic registration automatic registration using console, but uh, the support is generic, so um, you can use whatever you want. So my session chair is already <laughs> <laughs> lifting her microphone, but the good news is I'm ready to wrap up. So I've promised you prediction. You have dashboards, you can see what's happening. You have predict linear and awesome high school mathematics. It can tell you that something is coming up. Alerting does the alert manager. Uh, it has many, many integrations. PromQL is Turing complete. You can do anything you want with that. Check. And your worldview, uh, if you instrument widely, which you should, uh, you can build awesome dashboards. You can play with PromQL. You have everything you need uh, when things go south. So we've covered everything. And uh, I hope you're eager to measure all the things. So 
I've put up a page. I do this always. It contains all the links. Well, I didn't mention so many links, but it's uh, it's a collection of links about concepts and ideas and best practices. So you should check it out. You should follow me on Twitter and get your domains from Vario Media if you speak German, which you probably don't. But my employer requires me to say this at the end. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. That was great. I think we have time for exactly one question. <laughs> Make it good. So I, I get the impression that this is for a mega data center of like thousands of servers and trying to aggregate. What would the minimum size be that you would deploy Prometheus on? Uh, so your impression is very wrong. <laughs> uh, Prometheus doesn't need a lot. Uh, you, you can really uh, so. One of the things about Prometheus, for example, compared to InfluxDB, is that it's uh, optimized for one use case, which is a stream of named numbers, and it's very efficient with that. So, of course, an SSD is great, but you don't need an SSD, and it has very low uh, CPU um, CPU requirements. Um, so the maintainers always throw around numbers using AWS speak, which I don't really understand because we run everything on metal. But we p our first uh, Prometheus instance was on a very, very old server, and it ran really great. And additionally, you have the possibility to forward all your metrics to both Graphite and InfluxDB. And we put, we put InfluxDB on a much faster server than SSD, and Prometheus, while being mostly idle, was able to, to DOS the InfluxDB. So it's you can start with very little you can if, if you have one app on one server you can put prometheus next to that app and the app will even notice it's really really efficient and uh yeah it doesn't need anything so just on that so um, would you bother i mean if you've got one app on one server would this would it make sense to run prometheus for one app on one server What's the alternative? I mean, is this app important to you to, yeah. to any degree? Yes. <laughs> because uh, the other solutions are not easier to run. Anyone who's ever run, uh, ran uh, Graphite will tell you how painful that is. And uh, InfluxDB is not that much fun either. And it's much higher overhead and much higher complexity. Prometheus is really, you just start it, and you point the web server at it, and it works. You can just play with it. And that's why I really like it. It scales with you. It's rather hard to, or it's not hard, but it's if you reach its uh, its boundaries when it gets uh, like a, a lot of uh, metrics, a lot of the time, then it gets more tricky. Then you have to start to think about federation. How are you gonna distribute your data, or you just look what uh, digital, digital Ocean is doing? But especially for beginners and for people who are just getting into uh, just rising something from the ground, it's really great. And there was literally a talk at PromCon, at the Prometheus conference, which was um, Prometheus is good for your new startup, or something like that. Uh, it's really great. Just try it. Uh, thanks so much, Nick. That was great. Yes. Uh, <laughs>